Hey YouTube. Uh, now, last time we left each other, I told you I was going to show you the contents of my clothing valise and use this as an opportunity to tell you the difference between a bedroll and a valise and a wallet. And uh, the first, the last part of that is going to be fairly easy. Uh, here's this old guy to explain to you the difference between a bedroll, a valise, a pack, and a wallet. Let's watch. Okay, now, this is a bedroll. This is a valise. This is a pack. And so is this. These two things on this end are wallets. And so, is this okay okay all right now that I've watched that we probably should do two videos uh, one on this subject the difference between you know what I'm saying and we'll do another one on the contents of the police and this one will go into history of gear because it is applicable and the contents of the police will go in the living history part. So, uh, give me a few seconds. i got to go get some pictures, load them up so that I can discuss this subject properly this time. Okay, first let me say that one of the reasons why I do these coming to terms things is not for me to tell you that you're wrong or that I'm smarter than you are because I know these things. The reason why I do this is I hope that you're taking these videos as a springboard for your own uh, research into classic camping, into the history of gear. And in coming across personal accounts and magazine articles, you're going to come across terms that might mean something to you in the 21st century it was completely different to the fellows who were writing these in the early 20th century. The best example of something like that I can give is when I got a diary of a World War I doughboy and read in there that he and the guys from his squad got a week's leave and they went to Paris and had a gay time. Okay, now I know that what he was saying was they had a lot of fun. But there are some people who are going to read that with their 21st century vocabulary and come up with a totally different conclusion. Okay? So this is why I'm trying to explain these terms so that when you come across them in magazine articles or, or diaries or personal accounts, you'll know, you'll better know what they're talking about. Okay, so... Now let's talk about bedrolls, okay? A bedroll is a package, a means of transportation and carrying your sleeping gear. And possibly articles of sleep-related clothing, okay? Like a pair of, like a union suit or a, a sleeping shirt, something like that. But a bedroll is pretty much dedicated to sleeping stuff, okay? It's rolled up for convenience and transportation and can be used as a field expedient shelter, although its primary purpose is to be able to transport your sleeping gear and protect it from the weather and dirt and dust and grime that would be involved with travel, okay? As far as my definition goes, my observation is there are two basic styles. 
okay? Or I'm going to call the American pattern and the British pattern, because that's pretty much the way it breaks down, okay? The American pattern be uh, bedroll is based on the Buzzacott camping combination. As Francis Buzzacott, he was an author at about the same time that Horace Kephart and Warren Miller and uh, those guys, okay? I don't think Buzzacott gets as much recognition as he should get, but that, we'll leave that aside. And what it is, is basically a waterproof ground cloth that has two ends that can fold in and the two sides can fold over thus creating a waterproof envelope for your blankets or sleeping bag, your mattress, and maybe some clothes. Okay, this is what the Buzzacott five-way combination looked like. When Buzzacott did it, it was a design, it was not a product. Now, a lot of people copied that and sold it, like this guy did. Okay, Buzzacott's pattern became the basis for the military's officers' bedrolls, okay? A particular bedroll you saw in that video is a World War I, actually pre-World War I, officer's bedroll from the Kill arsenal uh, that officers could purchase through quartermaster stores. Now, here it is laid out. And those of you who are World War II collectors will notice its uncanny similarity to the model 1935 officer's bedroll. That's because the 35 bedroll was based on this 1916 bedroll. Okay. And here we have it. I've got a light mattress with a mattress cover on it. And inside is a sleeping bag that's going to be the subject of an upcoming video. Okay, now that's the American, most of the American bedrolls follow that same general pattern. Here's another one that belonged to a World War I officer uh, who uh, didn't go overseas. He was in, I believe, the 14th Division, which uh, gathered together, started training, mustered, but wasn't ready to go overseas when the armistice was signed. The army said, thanks for showing up, guys. We'll call you if we need you. Take your gear home so that you can bring it with you when you come back. And this is that bedroll. It's made out of oil cloth, and it has a sleeping bag inside as well uh, that is going to be the subject of, uh, of that same video we talk about the other sleeping bag. Okay, now that's the American pattern. Now let's talk about what I call the British pattern. Okay, now speaking of upcoming videos, in addition to those, uh, that video I'm talking about on those two World War I period sleeping bags, uh, at the end of this video is going to be a link to the uh, clothing release contents. I'm going to release these two videos at the same time. So if you want to see the contents of the Belize, you can link to that at the end of the video. We also got coming up, uh, after I get back from my camping trip, I'm going to be making Warren Miller's sleeping bag. And you'll be able to follow along with that and end up with a good period classic camping sleeping bag as designed by one of the leading lights of classic camping. And also, I just mention here that uh, please like and subscribe to my channel. Like the video, subscribe to my channel, hit that notification button so that you don't miss anything. When you do that, you help other people find these videos who are looking for the same kind of information you are. So give us both a hand. All right, let's talk about the British stuff now. Okay, now the British pattern was very similar to the American pattern. And it is called generally the Woolsey pattern of, of bedrolls. Uh, it's a pattern of bedroll that was developed 
for the British military primarily in the late 19th century. I don't know whether or not Buzzacott modified that design or if the British modified the Buzzacott design or if it was a case of simultaneous discovery. We find a lot of that in the history of camping gear. But the principal difference is, is that the Woolsey pattern, the British pattern, has, it does not have two equal sides that fold over. Okay, It's characterized by one side that is as wide as the bottom and a smaller side on the other side. But it still closes at the ends. One end is kind of shaped round to fit a pillow and possibly some more clothing. But both items have the same basic form and function. Now I'm spending a lot of time on bedrolls in, in this video because they apply mostly to camping. Out of all these articles that we're going to be talking about, the one that applies most to camping is the bedroll. They're very common if you're looking at pictures of vehicles, guys fixing to go camping, just like I am, that I don't have a model T. Guys fixing to go camping, and they've got their Model T or their Buick or whatever car it is they're driving loaded down with rolled stuff. Some of those rolls are tents, some of them are bed rolls. And the reason why you use a bed roll on a car from the 1920s and the 1930s is because it doesn't go in the trunk. It gets lashed to the side and it's going to get rained on and mud is going to get splashed all over it and it's going to get dusty. So put it inside something. Put it inside something that if you need to, you can unroll it and sleep in it. The Woolsey pattern bag is set up so that if you wanted to, you could crawl inside and throw it over the top of you or you could elevate that one side, put a couple of poles in it and you have a small tent. You can do the same thing with the uh, Buzzacott pattern. What it does is it gives you the small tent going this way, but you also have a much larger flap that you can pull in over on top of yourself. Okay? Okay, that's it for bedrolls. Now let's move on to these other things. Okay, as far as packs are concerned, I'm not going to mention much in this video about packs. What I'm going to do is refer you to this video here. Right click on it if you haven't watched it already and watch it at the end of this video. That is coming to terms with backpacks. And it explains to you what a pack is. Okay? We're going to move on to wallets. And I'm just going to mention right now that a wallet is smaller than a valise, which we'll get to in a minute. A wallet is smaller to a valise. It is something that usually folds. And it's to hold small articles. Used to be a lot more wallets in, in the possession of people in the early 20th century than there are today. Right now, the only wallet you really have is the one you carry in your back pocket, and that practice is beginning to fade with all the electronic stuff because right now the wallet's only function is to carry credit cards and money. But we made... In, in, the, in this series, uh, which I'll probably link to at the end of the video, you know, the series on, on how to make a clothing wallet. And that was for small articles of clothing, underwear, face cloths, that kind of thing. Okay. And then the other wallet that I showed there is this. Uh, it is sometimes called a toiletry roll. Uh, I will show the contents of this at the same time I show the contents of my valise. But this is a small one. It carries, basically, that's your portable bathroom. Except you don't poop in it. 
Which brings us to the bullies. Now, I, and this here is the bullies. Now, a valise is a package that is designed to carry everyday clothing. Okay, it can be a roll like this, or it can be a small, soft-sided bag. Today we call these things suitcases. But in the early 20th century, suitcases were for, wait for it, suits. Okay, everyday clothing goes in your valise, but you wouldn't put your dress clothing in there. The way this works is you lay it out flat, you lay your clothing in it, one on top of the other, and then you roll it up. Okay, and what that does is it basically, uh, it's not quite like ironing or pressing, but it keeps them in, in better shape than if you just stuffed it into a bag. Now, we're going to talk about the contents of the valise here uh, in the next video. However, I do want to uh, riff off of my favorite uh, YouTube living history guy, Peter Kelly, whose uh, channel is called The Woodlands Escape. Basically, uh, late 18th, early 19th century stuff. Very good channel. But he's always talking about uh, a wee bit of history. And that's what I'll talk about here right now on this, a, a wee bit of history. This particular valise is named to a guy, I don't know if you can see that, George W. Perry, YMCA-AEF. Okay, now, the YMCA, of course, is the Young Man's Christian Yourself. Hold on a second, this thing's getting unmanageable. Sit still. YMCA, of course, is the Young Men's Christian Association. The AEF is the American Expeditionary Force in World War I. Now, I researched this fellow's name, and he was quite the pistol. Uh, I bought it because it fits in with my living history persona, which is a retired military man who began his service in the 1870s, retired from that in the 1890s, and went to work for the uh, YMCA after going to the YMCA college. Okay? George Perry was working for the uh, uh, International Committee of the Young Men's Christian Association, the YMCA, in France, helping the French army build a, a system uh, for entertainment of the troops to raise the morale of the French troops. Okay, When the United States declared war in April of 1917, Perry uh, transferred to working with uh, the American Expeditionary Force rather than the French army ended up uh, being assigned to an aviation unit, uh, and while he was there, he managed to wrangle a position. He, he went aloft, uh, flew a mission as a rear gunner in a de Havilland DH-4, managed to shoot down an enemy airplane, and then managed to... Uh, uh, get his uh, certification as an aviator and joined the army and finished the war as an aviator rather than working for the, the YMCA. After the war, uh, he went to work in the athletic department of the Phillips Exeter Academy in New Hampshire, which is basically a high school for very rich people. He was working there when George Bush and John Kerry were going to high school at Phillips Exeter, and he would have been one of their instructors. Quite a guy. Okay, all right. We're going to uh, end it here. Uh, the videos that are going to be linked to at the end of this video are going to be to the uh, uh, contents of this bag and uh, another video that I haven't decided on yet. So, uh, 
keep watching, subscribe and like, share the videos. We'll see you down the trail. Thank you.